Hey there again, fellow mitochondriacs. It's Dr. Peebler again for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. We're going to be talking about some practical approaches to metabolic therapy for cancer. So at first, I wanted to just go into a short synopsis of why ketogenic diets or keto diets can be so effective for cancer. If you've stuck with me this long on the journey through understanding cancer biology, cancer metabolism, and particularly the Warburg effect, it should become pretty clear why a ketogenic diet has such a profound effect. So there's been a ton of preclinical studies, and in those studies, they found that about 60% of the time, it has an anti-tumor effect. Continuing on, there is a host of different cancers that it's shown effect on. So the green would be an anti-tumor effect, blue would be zero effect, and then orange would be a side effect, red would be a pro-tumor effect, and then there's a preventive setting. So for these first three are brain cancers and the glioblastoma multiforme being the most deadly, and then the astrocytoma medulloblastoma. The T means that they have added this to the standard of care treatment, and R stands for restriction. So it's a calorie restricted. If you ever listen to Dr. Seafried's lecture, he talks about a calorie restricted therapeutic ketogenic diet. And as you can see, it has a large effect on several cancers. I guess I'd just like to preface that I don't think anybody who is in the integrative functional oncology space is going to ever recommend a ketogenic diet as a standalone therapy. It needs to be done in conjunction with other therapies and it needs to be done with the guidance of your oncology team. So remember, as we've talked about in the past, cancer cells possess the ability to bring in about 20 to 30 times more glucose than a regular cell, and it's going to break down that glucose through glycolysis about a 30 times higher rate than normal cells. As we've looked at in the past, as cancer progresses, it's going to use less and less of the mitochondria as the mitochondria become more and more deficient and damaged and dysfunctional. And we're going to use more and more of the substrate level phosphorylation through glycolysis. This is the Warburg effect that we've been talking about. So as cancer becomes more malignant and progresses more, it's going to be using this metabolism. The mitochondria are not going to be a functioning and they're not going to be able to use other substrates for energy like normal cells can. Just a reminder, this is what a normal cell's metabolism looks like. Glucose is coming in at some rate. It's going to get converted to pyruvate, and then it's going to get converted in, into acetyl-CoA and used in the mitochondria to make ATP. However, in a cancer cell, we're bringing in 30 times more glucose. We're making a bunch more lactate. Barely any of it's getting into the dysfunctional mitochondria to be used for energy. If it is getting in there, it's going to be used to make other things like biosynthesis for fats and nucleic acids to replicate DNA. It is not going to be used effectively by the mitochondria that are damaged and not able to produce ATP. In addition, HIF-1, as we talked about several times in the past, is going to be actually inhibiting mitochondrial function. This is just a cool slide I thought that was showing the hallmarks of cancer and how it relates to the Warburg metabolism. Remember, hyperglycemia by itself will increase your risk of cancer, but also the progression of cancer. So just by lowering your blood sugar, you're going to be doing yourself a favor. Not to mention, it's going to be actually killing cancer cells by limiting its ability to metabolize glucose and to make energy and substrates to grow cancer. Just by lowering blood glucose, we're going to produce less pyruvate and subsequently less lactate, which is going to help fix the acidic tumor microenvironment, which helps protect cancer cells from our immune system and from us being able to overcome it using chemotherapy or natural products. As we've talked about recently, the pentose phosphate pathways is critically important for a cancer cell to maintain its ability to recycle glutathione so that it can deal with all the excess oxidative stress. And when we cut off glucose by being on a ketogenic diet, we're going to cut off its ability to make glutathione and ribose 5-phosphate, which is going to cut off its ability to replicate because there's no nucleic acids able to make new DNA. Again, as we talked about, it's going to cut off pyruvate from converting to lactate, and it's going to help with shutting off the Warburg metabolism by decreasing HIF stabilization. It's going to increase AMP kinase activity, as we've talked about in the last video. It's going to help destabilize HIF so that the Warburg phenomenon does not happen, and it's going to help us regulate autophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis and better utilize oxidative phosphorylation. That's called metabolic reprogramming. And it's going to cut off other ways that HIF-1 is stabilized, such as pseudohypoxia from low NAD. By having calorie restriction, that's what the CR stands for, you're going to be able to increase NAD 
which going is going to activate CERT1, which is going to help destabilize HIF. And we're, we're cutting off multiple mechanisms of how HIF is stabilized and how the, the Warburg effect is allowed to continue and feed forward on itself to snowball into uncontrolled cancer metabolism and growth. So what is ketosis? So ketosis is where we take a chemical derivative called acetyl-CoA. We've alluded to acetyl-CoA several times in videos, but essentially pyruvate in normal metabolism is supposed to get converted to acetyl-CoA. Remember, in, in cancer metabolism, pyruvate is being shuttled off to make lactate. However, in normal metabolism, this is going to be converted to acetyl-CoA. It's going to be used in the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle to make energy by the mitochondria. However, in the liver, we're able to convert this acetyl-CoA to two different ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And those beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetates can then go through the bloodstream to other tissues that have functioning mitochondria, aka our healthy cells, and actually be used as energy while the cancer cells are being starved out. This is just another representation of the same thing. Basically, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate are being shuttled out of the liver where they're made and to other tissues. This is a neuron, for example. So it can be used by the mitochondria and improve its function. So what does it mean to be in ketosis? So in order to know what ketosis is, we're gonna have to talk about the main fuel sources that cells use to make energy. They use carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Those are what we call macromolecules. And this is what is looking at a percent based off of the standard American diet. So generally standard American diet is about 55% carbohydrates, 15% protein, and 30% fat. A standard ketogenic diet is 75% fat, 20% protein, and 5% carbohydrates. Whereas a therapeutic ketogenic diet is about 5% carbohydrates, 5% protein, and 90% fat. And if you wanted to look at this on a food pyramid, we'd see that a normal food pyramid has all carbohydrates at the bottom, protein in the middle, and fat on top. And what we're basically doing is we're turning this on its head. We have fat at the bottom, protein in the middle, and carbohydrates at the top. Now, there are varieties of ketogenic diets, so-called three to one and four to one ketogenic diets. And what it basically means is there's on a four to one ketogenic diet, there are four grams of fat for every one gram of protein and carbs. However, a three to one ketogenic diet contains three grams of fat for every one gram of protein and carbohydrates. So it's a three to one ketogenic diet is slightly less strict in terms of protein and carbohydrates compared to a four to one diet. And what this looks like is, are these formula right here, basically a three to one is going to be slightly lower percent calories from fat versus a four to one, which is a higher percent calories from fat. What does this practically look like? So this is just the mito food plan that I pulled from the IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine, some training that I went through. And this is a really cool plan because your doctor don't do not steal this completely because this is a general overview of something that I may give to a patient. This is not necessarily for you. You need to be discussing this with your own personal practitioner or physician. But basically, this is just a way for me to illustrate that it's going to give you basic general guidelines of what is okay to eat on this particular program. This happens to be a more ketogenic program. And then I have selected certain foods that I thought this patient should be eating and kind of crossed out things that are not okay for this particular patient like this. And so this is one way that you can have like a general overview of kind of what foods are good to eat on a ketogenic diet. This is why it takes a very important co-relationship or co-management between you and your practitioner. But ultimately what Dr. Seafried and his group created was something called the glucose ketone index or the GKI. And the GKI is a cool way of understanding where you are on the ketosis scale. And what they have is basically calculations. And what you do is you take your glucose in milligrams per deciliter, you convert the unit and you divide it by your ketones and you have your GKI. And the way you would functionally be able to do this would be by getting a glucometer where you would check a blood glucose with a drop of blood with a lancet. And then you have to do the same thing with some kind of a ketone meter. You can find both of these on Amazon or in, or in pharmacies. And then you'd have to take these numbers. You see how this is 104 milligrams per deciliter and this is 2.3 millimoles per liter. You'd have to convert that. And you have to put it in this formula to calculate your GKI. The other way you could do it is if you had a like a freestyle Libre 2 here or a continuous blood glucose monitor where you don't have to sick yourself every time and you have continuous monitoring of your glucose levels, which is pretty cool. I think especially if I was a cancer patient, I think this would be especially useful to have access to my glucose levels to know if I'm in the level that I want to be 
at. But anyway, so you could use a glucose monitor, again, measured in milligrams per deciliter, and then have, again, another ketone meter and make the calculation yourself. But what's actually really cool, and I learned about this from Dr. Seafried from listening to some of his lectures, is that there's actually this meter called the Keto Mojo. And the Keto Mojo is really neat because it takes the same drop of blood, will calculate your glucose and your ketones, and it will then calculate your GKI for you. And what's even cooler is not only does it save it on your you know app or device, but it'll actually send it to EMR or, or EHRs, you know, to health records, to your doctor. Like I, for example, have a Keto Mojo professional or practitioner account, and those that data can be sent to me. And then that when I see a patient in clinic, I can actually look at their GKIs, I can look at their glucose, and we can see what changes we need to make as a team when we're dealing with cancer. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this is valuable to you. I'm going to keep making these kind of videos. Please like the video and subscribe and share it with friends and family, especially those who are dealing with these kind of issues, because this could be absolutely life-saving. Until next time.